So welcome everybody. Um, we will start in just a second. First, I just want to say um, we're really pleased people have come. Uh, we expected maybe about 20 people. And last we looked, um, there was 862 people registered for this webinar. Um, and there's only 500 places. Unfortunately, we couldn't change that. That's a Zoom. Um, we tried to make it so it would be capped, so people wouldn't be disappointed. So if you're in, uh, you're one of the lucky ones. Right, I think it's about time we started. We've got a bit of a script, so apologies. We're not going to be totally looking down, but... Yeah, so welcome to our Spring Wild Food Workshop. I'm James and I'm Lee. Hello. We're from Woodland Classroom. We're a married couple, as well as business partners. And this is our Spring Wild Food Workshop. So welcome to everybody watching us here live and watching us on YouTube as well. It's really great to see you all and see there's so much interest in wild food and foraging. Um, and I think a lot of people um, are rediscovering their local patches, their green spaces, because they can't travel out to all the other places. And uh, people are discovering what's on their doorstep. And of course, there's so much wild food right on our doorsteps as well, and so much available. And we've been out today for a forage walk to get lots of plants and samples to show you. And there is so much. I found 13 just in one little hedgerow area. And we're going to show you as many as we can today. Yes, lockdown has been a catalyst for people getting out and getting reconnected with nature, which is something we teach through our business. But now people have had a real incentive to actually go out. And it is about what's around your actual home. And people have been able to explore that space without jumping in the car and heading off to a National Trust property or something like that. So it's all about exploring the green space around us. And it's been, it's great for everyone's mental health, physical health, and hopefully the planet. Great, so let's do a little rundown um, of what you're gonna get and what's gonna happen and the content over the next um, just under an hour. So in this workshop, we're gonna cover a minimum of six wild edible plants, which are commonly found. So we're not gonna do rare stuff that's difficult, we're gonna do stuff that you should be able to find in the hedgerows maybe even in your garden. We've, we've got samples. Lots of samples, we've got more plants standing by if we have extra time, depending on how fast we rattle through all of this. Um, we're gonna share a range of recipe ideas. Um, each plant. Yeah. Sure, and it won't just be us talking. Um, you don't just have to look at us for an hour. We have um, a couple of special guests who are gonna share some things they've had. We've had a, a really great response of people writing to us on email with recipe ideas and their experiences. So we've selected a couple of people to speak and share some different things that they've been doing um, during lockdown with wild food. We've had a lot of questions via email as well. We've had hundreds of emails. So apologies if we're not gonna answer your question. There's a good chance we won't, but we would love to, however. Yeah, there's gonna be a Q and A session towards the end. Um, and uh, we're also going to tell you where you can get further resources to learn about wild food and foraging in your area. And uh, as we said, so many of you shared your wild food um, recipes with us. And uh, what we're going to do, um, we're going to actually put these into a little ebook that we're going to send out free to everybody afterwards. So we'll compile the emails with people's ideas. If you have a recipe idea and you don't get a chance to share it here, then um, send us an email with it afterwards and we'll stick it in the ebook for everybody so you can all get a chance to see those recipes. It's gonna be great. Yeah, we thought that'd be a really good idea to share everyone's ideas because we've only got a limited amount of ideas, but with everyone joining us, we'll have loads for our e-recipe book. Okay, and of course you can get involved as well. We have the chat room, um, so you might be able to see that as a sidebar in your screen. You can post anything you want in there if you've got a recipe idea or a comment. We are monitoring that on another computer. Uh, I can see there's people from Cornwall, um, Devon, Mould, just down the road, Fairbourne. I know there's somebody from Finland here, all kinds, so that's fantastic. So uh, we are monitoring the chat. Somebody from Jersey, from Germany. Fantastic. Australia, you might win the prize for Thirst Away. Welcome. <laughs> Um, and later on in the show, we'll be saying, showing you how you can grab your place in the follow-up live workshop to this. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. Okay, so we are Woodland Classroom. We've been running since 2014 here in Wales. We deliver bushcraft, foraging, well-being in the woods and forest school courses and workshops 
mainly at two stunning National Trust properties and at events around the country. Well, that's what we used to do before the pandemic hit. Uh, but now, like everyone, we're having to um, adapt. And uh, what a fantastic response we've had, of course, to this, which is amazing. Um, but basically, our aim as Wooden Classroom is to reconnect people of all ages um, with nature, uh, whether that be through wild food, uh, through bushcraft, through forest school with kids. There's lots of ways in the well-being and forest therapy work you do. Um, a little bit about me briefly. Um, hopefully that'll give you some confidence that what we're saying is coming from a place of experience. I'm the head bushcraft instructor at Woodland Classroom. Um, um, I used to manage a 300 acre woodland in mid Wales, so responsible for a lot of trees and a lot of space. And um, my approach has always been about um, fostering people to have a closer connection with nature and learning to live with the land. So that's really important to me and that people learn to own their own knowledge and they get first hand experience. And uh, I've always had an affinity with the woods. I love being in the woodlands and forests, greenwood crafts, bushcraft, all those kind of things. Love it. I am more of a therapeutic side of nature. So I'm a counsellor and a life coach and also a woodland activity leader with Woodland Classroom. Um, I'm also a qualified mindfulness in the woods practitioner and I run courses out in the woods uh, and it's, it's all about this belief, firm belief, the power of nature is there to heal us if we need to. So um, at my training and work as a counsellor is about incorporating nature therapy into my services. Um, and again, it's all about reconnecting people with nature for better health and well-being. And what better way to do it than eating lots of yummy food for free? Yeah. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, um, you're going to make a brief yes. wild tea. While we're uh, teaching, um, sharing knowledge, I'm going to have a cup of tea. So here is my, this is nettle tea. I've got a big bag of dried nettle. <clears throat> Any herbal teas, I like to use the, one of these... Um, um, kettle things, these pots. The exact word to speak to right <laughs> yeah. now. So, but what I find is a lot of people are not that fussed about herbal teas. So I'm going to add some cleavers succus to it, which I'll show you now. A succus is where you juice the plant and add it to honey. I don't have a juicer, so I've just added the plant straight to the honey. And this will take two to four weeks to infuse. And then I will sieve out the plant and the honey will then contain all the goodness of the plant. So the plant itself is cleavers or goosegrass. No, it's not that one, is goosegrass it? Goosegrass is over here. There it is. Cleavers or goosegrass. In Wales, it's called khaki monkey. I'll just make my way through this forest here, thank you. Uh, Sticky willy is another name, Sticky Bob. It's the plant that kids stick to each other's backs, okay? But it is so good for you. It's a cleanser and a tonic for the body, but in particular, the lymphatic system. So it will cleanse all the toxins out of the body and contribute to overall good health. So I have my nettle tea, which I like, but many people think, Ugh. So a blob of honey with some cleaver goodness in we'll just sweeten it up to make it that bit nicer for the palate of some people who probably wouldn't really shout about nettle tea and it's a shame that they wouldn't go back and drink something that's so good for them when they can just adapt it to make it a little bit better so what are you drinking today james i am on what's what we call spruce juice so as you could guess, it's spruce um, in water, infused in water. And that's been in the fridge overnight. Um, it's very simple. And the spruce tips is an ingredient we're gonna be talking about today. It's really nice, it's very citrusy. Um, good alternative to citrus fruit. It's got a lot of vitamin C in, hasn't it? Yeah. And it's very nice. Like mm. flavored water without all the sugar. Slightly cucumbery, I would okay. say. Fair enough. Right, we're going to go through, through a few foraging <laughs> basics with you um, for those who are new to it, just in terms of kind of good practice. Um, so first of all, if you're out and about, it goes without saying, take a good field guide out with you. In fact, take two, because I find it's great to compare between the two. Even books do get some stuff wrong and you can notice contradictions between them. 
I like to have one with photos, one with illustrations. That can be really good. Um, so have a good field guide with you. And if you're not sure what it is, don't pick it. Um, we're not covering mushrooms in this session. That's in the autumn and we will get to that at some point. But uh, mushrooms are obviously can have quite uh, severe consequences if you get it wrong. Um, so uh, just something to be aware of. How okay. about being mindful as a forager Mindful as well? forager. So I teach mindfulness in the woods for health, but it's also important to be mindful about the impact we have on our environment. Apparently, during lockdown, places have been decimated of all their wild plants because everyone's getting really into foraging, which in one respect is amazing. It's great. However, if you live in an area where there's not much green space, then that can be devastating for the species of the plant. We're lucky, we're in North Wales, we could forage wild garlic till we're blue in the face and make very little impact, if any at all. However, it's about being responsible. I think what's important to um, understand as well is that foraging, the act of foraging and people foraging is not um, having, generally has a huge impact on the amount of plants. It's habitat loss, which is the biggest um, uh, danger to, to plants. Um, so uh, that's a much bigger factor. Um, but the main thing is to, uh, to be mindful, really, and to kind of know your environment. And the more you do this, the more practice you're going to get, the more you're going to understand the other plants. Um, so, um, yeah, basically, uh, be sensitive to your environment, and that confidence will come with experience. Just a quick a summary of the letter of the law when it comes to foraging here in the UK, so everybody knows what you can and can't do. So generally, of course, you need permission from the landowner to go onto their land, okay? Um, in many places, there is a common law right to collect fruit, flowers, fungi, and foliage, but it's for personal use only. Um, it is illegal to uproot any plant without the landowner's permission. But of course, when we're foraging as well, we're not uprooting a lot of plants, we are picking the leaves. And a lot of the time when we forage, particularly with things like wild garlic, we will use scissors to cut, so we're not pulling and disturbing the plant so much and disturbing the bulbs, and then the plant can regrow. Um, some rare plants are protected by law, so this is where a field guy can help, because usually it will tell you their conservation status. And just be mindful if you're on a protected site, like a triple SI, which is a site of special scientific interest. Um, generally those uh, protections uh, are there for the rare wildflowers and orchids, and nobody's going to um, get upset if you're picking some hawthorn leaves. Um, so yes, the more you know, um, uh, the more responsible you can be with it. Mm. I have a rule of fives that I use when I go to pick um, uh, foraged foods. Are there five plants? Is there one for pollination, for all the pollinators? One to be eaten by wildlife, because they like wild food too? Is there one to get trampled or to get destroyed? Um, it happens. Is there one just left to thrive for people in, to enjoy? And the fifth one is the one for the pot. So that's what I use. If there's five of them, I can take one. That's my general rule. Keeps things safe. Um, how about staying safe and where not to forage? Yeah, be aware of dogs and where they might be cocking their leg. You don't want to pick from uh, places like that. They're regular dog walkers. Um, the edge of agricultural fields where farmers might be spraying with pesticides. You probably don't want to pick them. Uh, busy roads, they might have taken in the pollution of the um, traffic and also covered in dust from the roads. Mm. So think about where you're picking. Right. Um, the foraging year, do you want to just mention that? It's quite interesting. Oh, yeah. It? So somebody asked a question about what's the sweetest food you can forage. Well, you'll find that in autumn with all the berries. But it's interesting, as hunter gatherers and as foragers before we had all this modern food, we would have stocked up on all the berries, we would have dried berries, we would have had lots of nuts, so lots of sugars and fats in the body. That would have sustained us over winter, probably put weight on us. Uh, then spring comes and we get all our fresh green spring growth. Now a lot of these flavours are not sweet, in fact they are bitter, but bitter is excellent for our digestive system. And our palates aren't used to bitter flavours anymore. So when foraging, people tasting things for the first time very often pull a face. It's because we're not used to it. We're used to high fat, high sugar foods all year round. Yet the, you can get used to the bitter flavours and actually find them really pleasant. So it's interesting at different times of year, 
we will have different types of plants, sweet, then bitter, but bitter is excellent for digestive systems. And actually in modern times, we, are, we have terrible digestive problems, Crohn's disease, IBS, you name it, but it could be due to we're not foraging anymore. Should we get on with our first plant? Yeah. Which is the spruce. Um, this is something that's really abundant at the minute. Um, we've got a sample here to show <laughs> you that we picked today. Um, let's, uh, you can talk about it and I'll okay. show you a sample. There we go. So now is the time that the spruce tree is giving out all its new growth, okay? So if you go to a conifer plantation, you'll find plenty. There we go. These are the young, fresh tips of the spruce tree, okay? You can they, see the colour is really different, yeah. isn't it? Here's the dark growth from uh, last year and the new growth is really apparent, isn't it? And it's these that you want. These have a very citrusy flavour, quite um, lemony, zingy. And you can eat them straight off, but they're quite sharp. You can use this in lots of uh, recipes. Now, in a recipe, if you were to use lemon, you could easily replace it with the spruce. Okay, the tips are packed full of vitamin C, potassium and magnesium. Native Americans are known to have used this as a winter remedy for treating coughs and colds and upper respiratory ailments. They are also high in antioxidants that improve the immune system functioning and help fight off infection and viruses. So well worth getting and possibly preserving. I've preserved some in sugar. This is spruce tip syrup. I made this the other day. I'm waiting for, this, for the syrup to reach up here and then I'll sieve that out and I'll have my own syrup for porridge, ice cream. It is full of sugar, but you could use honey. And I've also got a vinaigrette here which is apple cider vinegar and um, olive oil and some other things. We've got a video just on how I made all this stuff, so we'll give you links to that later. Okay, so some more recipes is salad, uh, summer drinks. You could cook, cook with chicken, fish, rice dishes. It would go really well with them. And I've not done this, but I would love to make a sorbet or an ice cream it would be an amazing flavour. Well, there's my... Here is uh, the spruce syrup that people yeah. can see being made. There's the final product. These are a couple of salad dressings with the red and white lids, and there's a load of the spruce tips. So you could make it into cough medicine or sore throat remedy. You could use honey, or if you're vegan, eat vegetable glycerin. We'll give you the link at some point following up this session to the video we've made all about the recipes. Okay, rattling through this, we're gonna go on to nettles now. Um, nettles is a great because everybody already knows them. So we can all be confident that we can go out and pick them with gloves, of course. Although uh, we have made a little video where we can show you how to pick it without gloves, if you want to uh, really show off. But of course, nettles gives you uh, a lot of confidence because uh, you can cook with them easily. They are used for all kinds of things. And as Lee will tell you, they are one of nature's superfoods. You can't talk about wild food and not mention nettles. They are the superfood of the plant world, okay? They have got so many health benefits and nutrients. So instead of taking a multivitamin and mineral tablet, you can just have nettles. They contain literally everything. They're very high in vitamin C. They enhance natural immunity. They're a blood tonic and treatment for anemia, high in iron. But the beautiful thing about nettles is they also contain the exact amount of vitamin C and folic acid that makes iron 100% absorbable by the human body. If you get given iron tablets by your chemist, the chances are you won't absorb it because you need, sometimes they advise you to drink fresh orange at the same time. With nettles, you don't need to do any of that. It's got it all in the right amounts. It's just incredible. It's an antihistamine, respiratory strengthener, regulates the blood pressure, restores the digestive system, excellent for prostate health, 
regulate breast milk production, use it to treat wounds, good for skin and hair. The list literally goes on for the benefits of nettle. And it's the top, top part of the nettle where all the energy is, those are the bits you want to forage. You don't want the lower down leaves, you want the top bits before it flowers. Once it flowers and goes to seed, all the energy is in the flowers and the seeds. So it's springtime, those top bits of growth. So some recipe ideas would be nettle soup. Again, we have a video on how to make that. Nettle tea, nettle and wild garlic risotto. We have a video about that. Nettle crisps, great for forest school leaders. Sargaloo, basically any dish that you would use spinach, just use nettle instead. I'm gonna butt in there. I wonder if anybody knows what the Hindi word is for nettle, if mm. there is one, because um, nettles go pretty much all over the place, because it'd be great to uh, be able to make the proper name for the dish. Uh, for yeah. the, uh, the sargaloo nettle equivalent would be lovely. So if you know that, pop it in the uh, chat for us. So we could have a nettle and garlic yogurt dip. Um, later in the year, nettle seeds. They are a powerhouse of energy. So you can make them into those little energy balls. Yeah, get experimented with nettle. Nettle's great, isn't it? It's so versatile, isn't it? And of course you can get, gather it in abundance. Now's a good time of year as the summer, as we come into summer, we're gonna get uh, more leggy growth. It's gonna darken off the leaves. It's not so good. They become more leafy, <laughs> uh, for want of a better phrase, as the cellulose builds up in it. And that's true of so many uh, green plants. But if you keep harvesting or cutting the top of your nettles, if you've got a patch in the garden, it will keep putting on that new growth for a while and not going to seed. So you can keep harvesting your nettle for a good few months. All the yet. way into autumn, you can keep having that fresh growth. But you go back to the same patch every time. And on the subject of nettles, I think you've probably heard quite enough from us for the minute. So we're going to go to our first guest, who has been doing something quite interesting with nettles recently. She sent us some pictures. So we're going to ask Kay to raise her hand so we can unmute her. There she is, and we're going to hear from Kay. Hi, hi everybody. Um, thanks James and Lee for hosting this, it's been wonderful. Um, yeah, so I made some sourdough bread um, with nettles the other day. Um, I came across a sourdough bread mix in my cupboard and thought, why not stick some nettles in there? Um, and it worked out to be really, really tasty. Um, I, I knew they had some medicinal benefits, but I hadn't realised, you know, quite so much. So I'm really pleased that I'd made it, you know, as palatable as that. Um, to the point where my 20-month-old was happily eating it as well. So that's really good. Um, as you were saying, there's a few tips when it comes to picking nettles. Obviously, I picked the ones from the top um, of the plant. Um, apparently, the paler the leaves, the better. Um, and I used heat to try and get rid of the sting as well before I kneaded the dough. Um, so I just poured boiling water over that before I did that. Um, yeah. And also, just to touch on, somebody was asking about um, there being like an irritant in the plants. Um, I, I don't know, but I've heard that once they flower, it can be an irritant to the urinary tract. Um, so I think it's worth being aware of, isn't it? Um, this, this picture that you're just showing now, so that's the nettle bread. Um, and that's with a um, dandelion marmalade that I made. Um, and that was really, really lovely. So yeah, it was a good experiment. <laughs> Did you find the dandelion petals added any flavour to your honey, of to your marmalade? Yeah, um, difficult, difficult to describe, um, other than floral, aromatic, I suppose, in a way, really subtle. Um, and it was a bit of fun because obviously nettles and dandelions, you can't, you can't go wrong with them. Everybody can identify mm. them. And it was something that I was able to do with my daughter as well. So, yeah, I definitely recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that nettle bread looks fantastic. Looks really good. You can see the little bits of nettle in there. And Kay made an interesting point there about um, she poured some boiling water on to get rid of the stinging hairs. Um, if you think about getting rid of the stings, it's quite easy. You can apply heat. You can do boiling water. You could wilt them over a campfire if you wanted to, or you could bruise them. That would also work by bashing them. Great, thanks Kay, that's awesome. And I like the simplicity, you just used a bread mix that you found in the cupboard. That's nice. Yeah, and, 
<laughs> that's it well we thought we'll try that and since then we've um, made some soda bread as well which was lovely and um a slow cooker nestle bread as well so any recipe that you find online obviously there's a difficulty finding yeast at the moment but any recipe online put a few nettles in at the end and it seems to work so all good <laughs> great great love it thank you very much Kay. there she is hello rebecca hello what are you going to tell us about making today well um, wild garlic is in abundance or has been so I've made absolutely anything possible with wild garlic um, and you've asked me to talk through the wild garlic alioli mayonnaise depending on how far you go with it <laughs> Great. So, um, really simple but does need a little bit of care and patience a bit of TLC so um, shall I would you like me just to whiz through the ingredients and then what I did that would be yeah. great and we'll put a couple of pictures up of what you did. Okay, right. Well, basic ingredients, enough for two people, two portions of mayonnaise-ish, um, was one egg yolk, uh, 150 ml of rapeseed or vegetable oil, whichever you prefer and have at hand, 20 ml of some kind of acid, so apple cider vinegar if you like a sweeter flavoured mayo, um, or I use lemon juice because I like the tartness. Um, half a teaspoon of English mustard and a bit of seasoning. Um, and what I do is basically put um, everything other than the oil, I put everything into a little bowl and whisk it up for a minute or so to get some air into it. Um, and then um, I get some blanched if you want, raw and washed if you don't want, but some um wild garlic leaves and i put flowers in mine as well because i just eat everything um and uh you you chop up the wild garlic leaves and fold that into the um the liquidy mix and then really really and i can't emphasize it enough really slowly you you keep whisking your egg mixture and start dribbling in your oil um, and it's literally three to five drops at a time there's a lot of tears shed um, if you put too much oil in because it separates and the idea is that you want it to emulsify and become a stable um, stable compound so um, dribble 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 for a good kind of I, I dribble my oil um, and then beat for 30 seconds then a dribble more another 30 seconds and this goes on for about five ten minutes um, and then eventually you get you get a lovely mayonnaise alioli kind of thing um, the more oil you put in and the more you beat it the thicker it becomes so then you're left with either really thick creamy mayonnaise um, if you bail out a little bit earlier, then you've just got a nice pourry drizzle to put over fish or chicken or whatever else you might want to drizzle it over. Um, and that's basically about it. That's awesome. Thank you, Rebecca. Now, Rebecca, Rebecca does herbal medicine for doggies and animals. Rebecca, if you want to put the name of your Facebook page in the chat, if anyone's interested in finding out herbal medicine for Rebecca, Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. That's lovely. So we're going to talk now about um, another common plant you can find. It's a good one that grows in kind of cracks and crevices between the pavement. So if you're living in a town, this might be one you find about the place. It's chickweed. It's, it's not a great example. Chickweed. It's, would you like one, to it's one of my favourites. I love it. It's not bitter. It's not one I would cook with. I would probably just keep it raw in a salad. Great in a pesto. Okay. Um, chickweed. Uh, I used to pick it in, in, my, in an allotment for my uncle for his chickens and his birds. Uh, it is high in vitamin A and C. It is an excellent spring tonic. Plenty of minerals including iron, copper, magnesium and calcium. It has a timing action for the body's timing action. A I don't know, it's got an action for the body's internal organs. Probably best not to ask really, <laughs> isn't it? 
Um, um, it's probably just toning, good. Toning, toning, I think it tones, something like that. But it's also good to use as uh, and to make into a cream for itchy and hot skin conditions like a sting or eczema. Good for inflammatory problems of the liver, kidneys and lungs. Again, it's one of those plants where the list goes on and on. Should I talk about, a bit about how to recognise it? You should all see a great big picture of the chickweed there, quite close up. It could be quite a small plant, as you saw the little sample in Lee's pot. Delicate. It can get quite long and leggy as well though, can't it? Yeah, but it tends to be quite floppy, yeah. gr ground uh, hugging plant, very delicate, tiny little white flowers. It can go yeah. easily missed. The key to identifying chickweed is that if you look on the actual stem of the plant, you will see a single line of fine hairs running along the stem. And that's really a, a unique way to spot chickweed. Um, so look out for that close. You can just see the hairs in this picture, actually. And also the leaves are in pairs. Um, you get um, leaves in a kind of a cross shape, two go one way, two the other way. And you can spot that when you look at it from above. And as, as we say, it grows in all kinds of cracks and crevices. So uh, look out for that. Get your ID books. Um, so anything else? Oh yeah, so ideas for, for a recipe for that would be uh, mix it up with couscous, hummus, mayonnaise, or a dip, or have it as a salad or in a pesto. Those are my favorite tips for the chickweed. Right, while we're here as well, we want to take a moment just to tell you about where you can get some more information about foraging and some of the other stuff that we'll be doing. And then we're going to crack on with some more wild plants and recipes as well. And we're going to hopefully have another guest joining us as well. So if you're enjoying this workshop and you're really getting into wild foods and you're finding out everything you can about it, um, then you could find out more by joining our tribe on Patreon. We have a Patreon page, which we set up during lockdown, um, because we're in a small business and uh, needed to diversify. And uh, there's loads of content on there um, that you can get. Um, we put on a load of stuff, haven't we? It's all exclusive to our patrons and it's a minimal cost. But you can have a live Q&A every month, just like this one, where it'll be less than 500 people. So a bit more interactive. There'll be t topics including wild food, foraging, plant and tree identification, which is his big thing, tree ID, mindfulness techniques, all sorts. Every week we post a video called Whispers in the Woods because we are constantly learning, constantly learning mm. about our natural environment and our woodlands. And every time we learn something new or find something of interest, we make a little video, stick it on our Patreon page, you get to see that. That's true, isn't there? And it's all amusing from the woods. Sometimes it's bushcraft stuff that I've uh, found out. Um, a bit of animal tracks was the latest one that we uh, put up there just earlier this week. And also we've got an extensive YouTube channel which is growing. And we'll cover all sorts of recipe ideas. I'll go with uh, bushcraft through the ages, all sorts of videos. And for, for the, for the um, three pound a month to join on Patreon, you are actually supporting us to make more of those videos. And you'll get early access to those videos if you join our Patreon page. And we've put a few things up already which are live on for our patrons now. There's a few videos. We've made a video, how to forage spruce and how to use it, where Lee's gonna go through some of the, the uh, recipes for the yes. dressings that she's made and goes through that. That's gonna be on Patreon first and yeah. then on YouTube in a week's time on our channel. We've done a video, how to make a basic nettle soup um, so how to put that together. So that's a video that patrons can watch as well. It shows you how to go from start to finish with that. And then you can add all kinds of tasty stuff to it. It makes a great base. We've also created a video which backs up this workshop. We've been out in the hedgerow today and we have videoed every plant we're talking about today to show it you in the wild. Yes, it'd be great if we could film this out in the woods and in the hedgerows, but the signal won't work and the cables don't reach that far. So we've had to bring samples. So we've made a companion video where we go out into the hedgerow and show you all these plants. So it makes a great companion. It's about uh, 15 minutes long, the video. So there's a good bit of content there. And that's all for patrons. And it's about building a community. We have so many people who have come on our courses and it feels like the, the beginnings of a tribe. Or not even the beginnings. Some people have been on loads of our courses and they, it just feels like a family. So that was, that was, a big reason for creating this Patreon thing. 
you get to interact with us more. And yeah, you can find that on patreon.com on Woodland Classroom. Um, search that or we'll send everybody the link afterwards. So uh, we'll stop talking about that now. There are two other things we want you to know about though. There's another big project that I've been working on um, during lock, well, before lockdown, I've been working on it for two years, but during lockdown, I finally had a chance to get somewhere with it. And that is a tree ID video course. Um, and uh, that is going through all the native species in Britain, of which there's about 50 kind of native and common species. So if you're really interested in learning more about trees, I've actually um, been to upload a free taster course um, in the next few days. I tried to get it ready for this, but there was too much prep to do. And that's going to be a great, there's going to be a video in every season. So for every tree species, there'll be four videos, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Hundreds of photos. Um, there'll be live question and answer sessions on that as well, um, if you join the full course. But there's a free taster that you can try with no obligation and try it out. You'll learn about three trees. I've made some videos. You can watch me standing around in the cold telling you about trees from the safe warmth of your lounge. Um, so uh, we'll send you a link to that as well. It's called Kickstart your tree ID skills. And that's totally free and no pressure to upgrade then to the other course. You should totally take advantage of that. And of course, just briefly, we run courses, usually, um, up here in North East Wales, um, in two beautiful National Trust properties. We're running uh, wild food and foraging. Um, we are running that um, in uh, September and in spring next year. There's some dates on our website. I will show you that now what we've got. So there's some course previews. We've got Woodland Mindfulness and Bushcraft. Our first autumn foraging uh, course with mushrooms is actually already sold out. So there's only one date left in September. So that's fantastic already. Yeah. Uh, and the next spring yeah. foraging. The next spring um, is happening. When is it? Is it March or April? 17th of April next year. That's a long way away, but already people are booking, which is great. Mm -hmm. Well, that's enough plugging for now, isn't it? Should we get yeah. back to some uh, quality content? Let's unmute Eric and see if we can get him. Eric, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear hey. me? You can you can say your piece. I'll shut up and let you talk. <laughs> I was having some technical issues earlier, so uh, I managed to get on via my uh, phone in the end, which is great. Cool. So we'll put yeah. some pictures up while you talk through the, those two recipes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, the whole lockdown starting. Um, earlier this year has really sort of driven me to go out in the local area and uh, see what I can find. I've been very lucky um, close to where I am and um, found quite a number of things just in uh, one small area. Um, two of those things are the watercress. So we've got a lovely fresh spring that's, um, that runs from the village and in there it's uh, you know, beautiful clear water and um, uh, watercress in abundance there so your rule of five you know I can pick bags and bags of the stuff and uh, that will keep me fed for as long as it's going. Um, now the uh, I, I like to just use watercress as you would do a salad so no special recipes here just uh, using it on some sourdough bread with um, uh, poached egg. Um, another recipe that uh, I've, I've tried is um, the um, tagliata. So I'm, I'm lucky enough to, to have to travel to, to Italy um, before lockdown time, of course. Um, and yeah, that's the tagliata there. So I've got some lovely uh, longhorn beef from uh, a friend of mine who raises them not so far away. Uh, with some, um, so that's just fried uh, piece of beef. Um, uh, leave it fairly uh, rare. You cut it up into slices. And sorry, I've got my cat is just about to march his way in. Um, uh, and yeah, cut the beef up, um, put that onto a bed of uh, the watercress, and parmesan shavings on top of that, and uh, with a bit of balsamic vinegar drizzled on the top. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's uh, sorry, my, my cat does like to join in. I mean, Why not? <laughs> um, so yeah, watercress um, just as a salad. The, the other thing that I did do was uh, the watercress soup, which is the same recipe as I used uh, for nettle soup, which is frying some onion, some garlic, um, uh, and then chopping up a potato and um, sweating that off as well. Then you add the, uh, all of the watercress into there with some chicken stock, 
cook that down for uh, maybe just five minutes and then whiz it up with a blender. And um, yeah, it's fantastic soup. Maybe with a little, little um, squeeze of lemon into it as well. Great. Watercress. Hop shoots. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I realised not so long ago that there's, my mother started growing hops uh, up the side of her house. Uh, and um, then I realised there's a lot growing by the sides of the fields. Now, I, I know that you mentioned that um, picking by the sides of the fields can be a little bit, um, there, there is danger of um, getting some of the, the pesticides that they spray around there. So I am conscious of that. But uh, this stuff grows in abundance around the um, around the woodlands and the edge of the fields there. And um, what I do there is just pick the, the tender shoots at the top. I mean, this, uh, when it's much younger and it's just getting out of the ground, you can pick the shoots just as they're coming out of the ground. They're a nice sort of purpley color and you can eat them raw straight away. Uh, the hop shoots now, you can still pick them, pluck the tops and eat them like that, but um, other ways are you can just put them in a griddle pan with a, with a bit of oil, um, a splash of soy sauce maybe, and they taste fantastic. Um, the, the griddling sort of takes maybe a little bit of the bitterness away that's there. Uh, the other way is just uh, simply blanching them. Um, uh, you can put them in the freezer as well um, after you've blanched them and, and keep them for some time. That's fantastic, Eric. There's some really good tips there. Thank you ever so much. My um, yeah, we'll definitely add some of those to our recipe ebook. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for your input, Eric. That's awesome. Let's stop sharing our screen, and we're going to welcome Cinny, who's from Finland. We yeah, we met. We met. We went on a, a forest therapy immersion week last year in Finland. So we're very interested in nature connection as a therapy and mm. this is where we met Cindy who also teaches bushcraft and canoeing or all sorts of cool stuff so so over to Cindy welcome thank you hello everyone so at the moment actually I'm not in Finland but in Switzerland ah. uh, which is kind of great because the uh, foraging season is only starting in Finland at the moment and um, in Switzerland I've been able to do it like two months now and um, you asked me to tell about my all-time favorite uh, wild food so here it is this is today the ground elder in Finnish it's called Vuohen Putki the straight translation would be um, goat's pipe apparently because goats like to eat it and of their pipe-like shape. And the other uh, common name in English for the plant um, is actually gout weed, or mm. so I read. So yeah, some of you right. might know it as a gout weed. And that name refers to the history of its usage as uh, uh, treating gout. And uh, this one, grows all over Europe, so it's native Europe, but um, not in Britain, actually. So somebody wrote in the chat um, some time ago that the nettle was brought in Britain by Romans, so was this plant. So it's been used as a food and medicinal plant very long time. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> yeah, you can find it in, in Finland, like northern parts of Europe, the southern parts of Europe and all over Britain. Um, well, nowadays people know it as a like annoying garden weed, and for some reason people want to rip it off. And it's very hard because um, if you just pick it, uh, it won't go away because it's like regenerates from the roots. So you have to dig it up all the plant if you want to get rid of it. But I, I don't really see the reason because. Um, once the first time I tasted it, I totally fell in love with it. For me, the taste is like like um, like freshly picked carrots. And um, some other people um, say it's like sweet parsley, but but I think it's more like carrot. And the the smell of the leaves is more like carrot too. It's rich in vitamin C, 
And when you pick it, you really want to find the young ones, as you can see in the picture in the middle, the young uh, light green leaves of the ground elder. And you can see the old one growing on the upper right corner. Um, it's uh, more dark and well, you can also eat it, but it's not that like uh, fresh and and sweet it's more like bitter and the leaves they are hard they are harder also mm -hmm. so there you can see the shape of the leaves there are supposed to be three leaves but uh, two of them are merged together in the picture and that's very common so <clears throat> so when you see that it's a very good um but signature for that for that plant. So there you can see how small they are when they are ready to pick. So that's when you want to be eating them, is it? Not when they're larger, like we've got here. Yeah. Looking at stuff yeah. really small. Yeah, and you can you you can find the small ones like throughout the summer, but of course they are most abundant uh, like during the spring and and uh, early in the summer. They grow very much like a carpet, don't they, along the woodland yes, floor, along yes. the hedgerows. So you'll see yes. other plants shooting out above them, um, and the ground elder is very much on the floor. Hence the name ground elder. Yeah, it's it's um, it's considered as a very uh, invasive species uh, because they they like they grow like carpets carpets all over the place and and form monocultures, um, stopping other plants growing and and the reason why they are growing in that way is, is that they um, they shoot new plants from from their roots that's how they grow but yeah uh, basically as with any plant you can really mix this up with with other other plants and you should always be aware that there are as with mushrooms with, with plants too, there are very poisonous plants there. Well, you definitely should not mix this up with young elders and there is the name because the ground elder leaves, they resemble apparently, I don't know since we don't have elder in Finland. Are so we just um, talking about the elder tree then? Um, yes. Yeah, the, yes, yeah, the elderberry. Yeah, so elderflowers, elderberries are edible, um, although you shouldn't have too many of the elderberry mm. seeds. Um, yeah, no, the leaves you don't want to yeah. eat, do you? Yes, but the leaves they smell odd. So, so when they are very young, they can um, resemble ground elder, but but if you like smell them, then you can uh, make the difference. And other plants, you definitely should not pick up as a ground elder are the cowbane, um, Latin name for that is Kikuta virosa, poison parsley, uh, the scientific, scientific name Aethusa cunapium, and poison hemlock, conium mm. mm, yeah. So, But those, those are, um, once you get to know the form of these the leaves of ground mm. elder, you really won't mix them up because the leaves are very, very much different. So I'm going to put up a picture of what you did with the ground elder. Let's have a look at that because that's pretty cool. Yes. Yes. So I, um, you can basically use that uh, in salads, in soups, like soup is a very traditional way to use ground elder. You can put it on your bread, um, but I like to do pesto. And I have a very simple recipe for pesto. You need ground elder, pine nuts, garlic. Um, and this is the most amazing thing. If you can find wild garlic, you can just replace the garlic, like normal garlic with wild garlic. And then you have like the most amazing wild food pesto in your hands. Then you use Parmesan, olive oil, salt and pepper. And basically you just mix them up and with eat with pasta that looks amazing that does yeah. look really amazing yeah <laughs> i'm not really a, a food photographer but 
That's a pass yeah, here for I'm sure. I'm sure it passed the, the taste test too. It looks great. Fantastic. Okay, thank you very much for sharing that, Cine. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, I just You're like welcome. to add for people who are vegan, a good way to make um, pesto is replace the parmesan with nutritional yeast. Top tip there. Okay, everybody. Next uh, plant, we're going to go on to one called Jack by the Hedge. That's what yeah, I call it. it. You might know it as garlic mustard, if you do know it. And it's all over the hedgerows at the minute. It's absolutely abundant. Um, it's really shot up. A few weeks ago, it was smaller. And like we said before, the younger plants are more, uh, are more palatable generally, a bit less chewy. Now it's really shooting up everywhere. The leaves are interesting. I'm going to pick a leaf here so you can see. The leaves look a little bit like nettle in their shape. I'll put that up. But when you put it uh, beside a nettle leaf, you'll really see the difference. But they've got that kind of spiky look to them there. Um, but they are much lighter green. Um, would you like to talk about the taste of this? and uh, what's Yeah, the I find this very bitter. I don't want to put you off, but it says garlic mustard. I don't think it's garlicky. I think it's much more mustardy. Um, and it's a strong flavour. Probably one kids wouldn't like. But it makes a great mixture in a mayonnaise, something like that. So you'd pick your recipes to put it in. And probably the younger the leaves, the younger the plant, the more delicate the flavour. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, well, no, first I'll tell you the health benefits, actually. It contains vitamin A, C and E and some of the B vitamins. Contains potassium, calcium, magnesium, selenium copper, iron, and manganese, as well as omega-3 fatty acids. Sounds like steel. It does. <laughs> <laughs> it has a warming and strengthening effect on the digestive system. So even if your palate is a little bit strong, do try and find a recipe for it. And that's the key with this sort of thing. Don't just pick it out of the hedgerow, taste it and go, ooh, no. Get, oh yeah, mom, yeah, grab those two things out of the fridge, James. Find a way to use it and add it to something because the nutritional benefits are so in abundance. Um, it, you just can't pass it by. Going to your supermarket and buying vegetables doesn't cut it compared to wild spring greens. You are, they are all pretty much depleted. Even the organic vegetables can be depleted in nutrients. Whereas your wild mother nature doing it naturally all by yourself does it best every single time. So if you want to up your health and nutritional input, you go wild basically. And that can be a really good companion for growing your own as well, which you know so many people yeah. are doing now. Um, uh, seed sales have gone through the roof, haven't they? So uh, that's really important. Um, I'm so, going to show off this little jar. Do you want to talk about I'm it? going to talk about uh, Jack by the Hedge and Wild Garlic together because the two of them can be used in all the same recipes. But I love simplicity. I want my nutrients, but I'm not necessarily going to get all creative and get all my pots and pans out. So in this jar is, I've used cleavers, nettles, Jack by the Hedge, wild garlic and I've whisked it all up in my um, food processor and added it to, I don't know, what was it Hellman's mayonnaise and mixed it all up. So the mayonnaise will, pre will preserve it for a few weeks and I can get some real good nutrients on every sandwich I have now. Uh, so it's a really good way, when thinking about foraging spring greens in particular, think about how can we keep them for longer. Okay, you can always freeze things, but I like to make mayonnaise. You could use that green mix mixture in a hummus, in a cream cheese dip, um, a dressing. Here, mm. I've got another way that I'd like to preserve these um, wild greens. Try not to spill this all over our laptop. It looks a bit rough, but that again is... It smells good. Yeah, that's wild garlic, nettle, jack by the hedge and cleavers total cleanser of the system super super nutritious that will last for weeks in the fridge and it's a mixture of olive oil and cider vinegar and that just preserves it 
So when I'm making a pasta sauce, right at the very end, in order to preserve the vitamins, I just put a dollop in or spaghetti bolognese or a stir fry. It just ups the nutritional value. Okay. Right. We're going to have to move on because we're going to run out of time. Wild Someone's asked a really good question. Can I just uh, go to that yeah, one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone said, if you're whizzing up nettles, um, do you need to wilt them to get rid of the stings first? Or does the whizzing action in your food process or whatever actually kill the sting? I never will. I don't wilt them and it doesn't sting me. Basically, give them a right good pounding in the uh, food processor. And so far, I've never been so. They're very smaller hair, so a bit of bruising um, uh, in the video um, on the hedgerow foraging walk. Um, you'll see where I actually uh, roll the nettle leaf up in my uh, hand um, to crush the hairs and then eat it raw. Um, so that kind of action will get rid of a lot of it. But while we're on the um, topic of preserving wild spring greens, We've made a kimchi here. He goes mad for it. He loves it. I love the kimchi. It's, it's the a... best food that Lee has made from wild plants, I think. Uh, so kimchi is from Korea, and it's usually done with um, cabbage, isn't it? Yeah, and vegetables. It's, it's fermented food, which is all the rage right now. It's an old technique, but it's really popular again now. But it can, contains all the goodness of the wild garlic, which is full of vitamin A, C, B, iron, selenium, saponins. It just looks like a green mess on the camera, but it smells gorgeous. It's, it's got uh, chili, chili and ginger, ginger and, and the garlic. wild garlic. And there's a video on, on our YouTube channel, which is obviously free to watch, called How to Make Wild Garlic Kimchi. So it just stinks. It's really strange. Strange. so nice. Uh, but I like pickled onions, so... Uh. Yeah, so um, here are some recipes that you could use wild garlic for and Jack by the Hedge, okay? Uh, pesto, I think that's one of the most commonly known recipes. I like to use nutritional yeast instead of parmesan because I don't eat dairy. So that's a top tip. Um, Add it to mayonnaise, like we've seen. Mixed into salads, mix up with couscous or into a rice dish. Mix in with a potato salad, a risotto, stir fry soups, add them to white sauce. So a mustardy leaf into a white sauce would be good. Sargalo, omelette. Right, we're going to go to our Q&A session now because uh, we've probably got about six, seven minutes left. And I've been writing down a few questions. So if you've got any questions now, pop them in the chat and we'll try and get through as many as we can and uh, answer them. Um, my favourite question tonight is from Fiona, which was, can we eat our Christmas tree? <laughs> uh, which is awesome. So, good question. So, the most common Christmas tree is the Norway spruce. Um, that's the one that was popularised by um, uh, Victoria and Albert. Um, you can't eat it at Christmas, because of course it hasn't got the new growth on it, and most Christmas trees are dead. You don't really want to eat that, you don't know how long it's been on. Some Christmas trees might well be sprayed as well to kind of preserve um, the green on them. But if you've got a live Christmas tree that you put out into the garden or into a pot each year, when you see that fresh growth, yes, there's no reason you couldn't pick it. But it would stunt the growth of the tree. So um, maybe it's best to like, trim off the branches that you don't want if you're forming a live Christmas tree and you could eat the fresh spruce tips. But it's this time of year. A lot of the pines and the other spruces um, tend to be used as teas. Yeah, or... Pine needle tea is a big one in the bushcraft world. But what we used was the Sitka spruce, which isn't used as a Christmas tree because it really is spiky when it goes hard and it can give you a bit of a jab. Yes, a good way to recognise the spruce tree, and my bushcraft mentor uh, taught me this one, um, is this rhyme, which is a short, single, spiky spruce. And that's a way to remember it as opposed to the pine trees. And that's because uh, the needles are short, they will spike you, whereas pines tend to be soft. And they're singular, they're not in pairs, they're singular on the branch. Um, another question, um, somebody asked, uh, Mel Jones asked, is there anything you could mistake for wild garlic? And uh, yes, there is one plant that comes to mind and that's Lords and Ladies, otherwise known as Cuckoo Pint. Um, have a look at it online, grab a Google picture of it. Lords and Ladies, when it's young, when it grows the same time in uh, mid, early mid spring as wild garlic, it can look like wild garlic. It's got those kind of long spear-like leaves if you grab me a wild garlic leaf. But if you see them side by side, you will see the difference. But Lords and Ladies is poisonous. You definitely don't want to be eating it. It totally transforms later in the year. It has a very distinctive green flower with a large cup and a brown stamen, hence the name Lords and Ladies. 
Here's the garnet leaf. Lords and Ladies is generally a little bit of a fatter leaf. It has um, uh, purple speckles on it. It's a bit more rounded, but it grows very low and forms a little bit of a carpet like wild garlics. That is one to watch out for. So a good field guide can help you with that. Somebody, uh, Karen, asked, do you use all the cleavers? The stalk is quite sticky. So that's worth mentioning. It's a really, that? really juicy plant. I use the top part of the plant. It really comes out of the ground easy. So you have to, yeah, and I just shove it all in. So this honey will actually get quite runny because the plant is so, so juicy. So if you do juice it, you do tend to get a lot of liquid out of it. And yeah, I wouldn't go to all the effort of picking off the leaves. I'm not even sure if that would be a better thing to do. I just, yeah, the whole plant, uh, well, the top part. Um, somebody said, what is Jack by the Hedge, please? Obviously it's confusion. That's the thing about common names. You can garlic have about four mustard. different names. It's garlic mustard um, or hedge garlic, some people it's call it as well. everywhere. It's all on the roadside. There's so much of it about. Jack by the Hedge, garlic yeah. mustard, um, hedge garlic. It's all the same thing. So have a little look. Shall we try and get in? Elm seeds briefly yeah, while we've got let's, a minute. Let's, do, let's do a tree. Could you pass that to me so I don't Ooh. lean over the camera? This is not a commonly known uh, wild food, but it's dead tasty. We have a video on this on YouTube as well. This is the elm tree. Now, obviously there was Dutch elm disease and that ravaged our elms, but over here we have quite a lot of them and they do survive to a certain age. And these elm seeds are a great food at this time of year. Um, they're abundant. It's these um, light green papery cases and they're nice and sweet. They're great they in a are. salad. Um, maybe with a bit of balsamic vinegar thrown yes, over, or a soy friends, sauce kind me. of rice dish. Yeah, cherry tomatoes, these, and balsamic vinegar as a side dish. Liz and Simon did that, um, so that looked great. I probably wouldn't cook with them because they're very delicate, but um, definitely as a raw food, really, really good. Because when we think of uh, trees and wild food, generally we're thinking nuts and berries in the autumn, or maybe elderflowers, which are on their way. But um, there are actually a few other things as well. So there's um, various leaves of trees that can be eaten, like the lime leaf as well. That's good at this time of year. And the lime trees are the most common trees which uh, line streets and parks. They're the ones that drop all the sticky stuff all over your cars. That's the lime tree. Um, good leaves for eating there. I can't find the lime leaves. That's okay, don't worry about it. We'll do a couple of ex ex extra more questions. Do you eat the whole elm seed? Yes. Um, Mm, doo -doo 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 -doo. What else have we got here as yes, well? Yes, including a little sort of paper case, yeah. Very quickly, a lot of people have asked about books to recommend for foraging to get into it. And we've got some of our favourites ready to go to show you. I've seen this one mentioned in the chat a few times. It's the little pocket version. Food for Free by Richard Maybe, one of the classics. And it's great because you can stick it in your pocket, of course. There are lots of other editions. But we recommend this, Food for Free by Richard Maybe. Very well known. Nice little handy pocket guide. It's got most stuff in there. For anybody who's watching with kids or has got kids, there is this book, um, Foraging with Kids. It's good stuff. Um, it's not the best field guide in the world, but in terms of getting inspiration, ideas and recipes, it's good stuff. There's lots of good things you can do with the kids there. You don't need children to get this book. It's good for adults, beginner foragers. Forget the with kids bit. It's a good, it's a good book. Good, good, good. Um, another one which isn't a book which is very handy, the Field Studies Council produce a lot of these fold out charts. Um, they do them for all kinds of things, birds, trees, everything. But they've done this one which is top 25 edible wild plants. Slightly splash proof, which is good and handy when you're out on a hike, but that's a nice thing you can shove in the backpack um, and that's really useful. It's got most of the common stuff on there as well as a couple of common poisonous ones which you could confuse with. And you'll find that on the Field Studies Council website. Again, we'll put links to these in a follow-up email for everybody because we're going through them a bit fast. Would you like to talk about your Bible? This one's my favourite. Absolute favourite. It's brilliant. They've written three books, these guys. It's um, yeah, Julie got... Bruton Seal and Matthew Seal. Yeah. Hedgerow Medicine. A very good guide. Um, very medicine focused. So the health and well-being side rather than food. But a lot of them are edible as well. So they're great books and we'll uh, send you uh, some uh, links to that. Um, this one, uh, The River Cottage Hedgerow Guide by John Wright, who is very well respected in the foraging world. It's not a fantastic ID guide. Um, it's only got kind of usually one picture per plant, but it's a, it's a good one um, for getting information about the plant. 
for instance, and it has a good range in there. So I'd recommend that. That's the River Cottage uh, Hedgerow Handbook. Last, last book, um, The Legend That Is, Roger Phillips. He's done all kinds of books, very much taking photos of just about every plant that's growing here in the country. And he does a wild food book, especially when he does a mushroom book as well. He does a trees book, wildflowers, and it's very photo heavy. Lots of big photos and samples of the plants, which is good. Lots of good stuff and recipes in there, as well as a bit of an ID guide. Not the best for out in a field, more of a coffee table book, but a lot of inspiration. So that's Roger Phillips, Wild Food, very much recommended. It's time to sign off because it's two minutes to eight and I imagine yeah, people are going to want to go and clap for the NHS. Thank you, everybody. Um, amazing, what a response. Uh, do send us your emails and recipes and ideas. We're going to send you all the link to the Patreon page, um, some of the YouTube videos, the books, and we'll compile that ebook of everyone's recipe ideas. So thank you for your support, everybody, and keep foraging, uh, forage responsibly. Thank you very much, everybody. Don't forget, look at woodlandclassroom.com or our Facebook page. All that kind of stuff were easy to find. Just look for the little red fox. Thank you, everybody, and uh, have a great weekend. Yeah, bye bye. Stay safe. Bye. bye.